married and have been married for 35 years. So, you know, there's that. Yeah, it's like uh, every good relationship starts with that one inciting incident. Uh, and then, like, you just make amends after that, and it just goes from there. But, like, I mean, every scene between Pip and Calamity after uh, their meeting of each other, like, they just get along. Like, Pod, especially when they go into uh, the school together and they have that adventure. And then Calamity insists on, at, at one point, the next adventure you go on, I'm going with you. And, and like, it, it, there's that camaraderie between them, and they just click. And, and uh, as Hartrying said, uh, there is a myth to opposite attract, which does... Which really doesn't work between Velvet and Calamity. But similarity between Pip and Calamity is wonderful. And it, mm. I think the best of uh, the chemistry between Pip and Calamity comes right after the Philadelphia chapter where Calamity touches down and says, Well, howdy to Zenith. And, and Pip literally says, I could just kiss him right now. <laughs> Which she should have. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, 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 I can. I can. I can see that. Is that 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 sort of like um, the sort of we are on the same page about the topic that we have not previously discussed. That is, like, that, that is that is good to see. Yeah. I think. I think too. The other thing is, is that like the the one. Uh, well, I think the other person. But like, yeah, I like can't figure out how relationships work. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 um, it's like how when you're talking about Xenothor, you can tell the author is married. Like, you can tell an author is straight by how they write relationships, just because queer people have they think about it a lot more. <laughs> they have to like come up with their own playbook because the the society the the, the standard playbook doesn't always work yeah right well and but the other thing that i was thinking of is is that like the way that that you know the only reason that they have that really that you i can think of that that's never justified and is so subtexty that it's not really even subtext it's just not there <laughs> is that like is would be the normal like the, the the thing that i could see that would actually push calamity and velvet together to be honest would be the fact that they're together and they've survived a lot of these life and death situations and there is some studies that show that basically that um people who survive traumatic events together tend to find them, each other more attractive because they understand each other what they've been through and so that's why like but that's like the only thing that's keeping them together and that, the other studies that also show that if that's the only thing keeping you together you're going to fail in like five years yeah I mean, it, it also also applies to little bit <laughs> Yeah. Mm, yeah. Request, yeah. Well, it does, in. though. But yeah, it just. I and I, I, I know there's I this like really big, um, a, a strong sentiment in a lot of Fallout Equestria fans that no, don't you dare suggest that Little Pip is anything other than lesbian. And it's like, one, calm down. She's a fictional character. Two. If sure, you, you can be adamant about Little Pip being a lesbian, and you can support the relationship she has with Amara, but like, you're really not paying attention to how with the relationship works between Pip and Amara. I mean, to 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 bring it like back, just just drag this conversation back into like R.I.P. comment section territory. I can understand where like that frustration is coming from in the sense mm -hmm. of like. Uh, why are you taking my lesbians away from me? That it's LGBT because... representation? Yeah, it's, it's it's like, if you make a straight character gay, it's like, well, there's still plenty of other straight characters there. Whereas if you make a gay character straight, that might be the the show's one gay character just gone. <laughs> um, it's not, I mean, it's not like the, the biggest deal in the world, but that matters to some people. And it's like, I can, I can yeah. What, which, I, what, I, I like, I'm, I'm liking how, like, I'm the one that's like, yeah, but eh. <laughs> 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 I'm always in the conversation, like, yeah, but I can see it. I mean, I mean, too, so. it's, I mean, but I also just like shipping people, so. I mean, I don't. I mean, like, you've talked about how lesbian you are. I'm also queer. Um, I. It's a interesting the spread of opinions. Yeah. 
Uh, so, 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 so that sense, so then, so, so would your ideal then say that we should have been, have been, uh, Calamity and Life Bloom? Yep. Oh. <laughs> that is, uh, wasn't expecting that. Uh, <laughs> that's also, like, that, that, I, I, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I, I, I feel bad about that. The, I was just supposed to be teasing. The, the, I, 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 like, I'm, I, this, this is like when I was at BronyCon and I, um, someone had like a Zakora and a, um, a Gilda figure, uh, just, just, just bashing them together, and I said, uh, what was it? Um, Zelda was. The, I said, and there's like, there's a ship name there now. It's like, okay, I'm writing this crack fic now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like that. That's that's the the headspace I'm in now. Where it's just like, hmm, in what universe would Calamity and Life Blue work? And I actually thought of one in that the uh, the relationship stuff isn't actually like, it's just a it's more of a joke, and sort of a mirror mm -hmm. of like, uh, Pip and Homage, and their no good bad Aww. idea of a relationship, and that you just kind of also have this parallel like booty call every time they come home, and it's just. Yeah. It, it 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 would like it requires a level of like nuanced relationship writing and sexual humor that I don't think it gets capable of based on the evidence we have in the story. But it's like <laughs> yeah, I can, see, I can see. I can, you know somewhere in the multiverse this exists. Excellent. Okay. Good. I feel better about asking my question and putting you accidentally on the spot. No, it's <laughs> That, that's something I hadn't thought of, and that's it, it amuses me now. I've actually put some thought into a ship between Life Bloom and Calamity, and it actually could make sense. So here's how I see it. So the Enclave is built on like, uh, it's it's put into law that uh, sir, it, it's basically homosexuality is encouraged in the Enclave because of. Of course, they have to control the population. Population control, yeah. So I think that all Pegasus Stallions are indoctrinated from childhood to be gay. And that childhood, uh, I'm sorry, <coughs> that Calamity actually struggles against this gay indoctrination to be straight. And like from time to time, he still has like gay tendencies. And then Life Bloom teases him about that. So I, I love this because we're, we're we're continually turning the cast into bis bisexual yeah. disaster collectors. <laughs> <laughs> anyways, uh, to, oh my god! To go back to drum thumping about oh, little Pip has to be lesbian because of representation. About that, I would much what? rather have a healthy heterosexual relationship between Pip and Calamity than an unhealthy lesbian relationship between Pip and Homage. It's it's um, not very good optics. I mean, I mean, I see, I see, I see what you mean, but like, I mean, if uh, I mean, there's there's also the thing that like a, a lesbian relationship can also be a bad one. Uh, it's like it's I suppose it's as much about like if the text acknowledges yeah but it's yeah a bad but, but that's the thing the story doesn't really acknowledge yeah. their relationship this, this as is, being yeah. unhealthy yeah it's it's kind of yeah. like can we have like one or the other it's like a, it's like if we're gonna have like a, a relationship that's like a feel good downtime thing then it should probably be a healthy relationship and then it's like yeah I see what you mean yeah yeah um, well no indefinitely and that's and that's you know that's kind of why like you know like I said I was, uh, I was like, the Pip Lamity is kind of a deep thing. But, like, you know, and, and I mean, again, like, I don't know if I'm on the side of it, I'll, I'll ship anything. Um, <laughs> I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I, I literally, it was, like, basically verbally shit posting and I said, oh, well, how about Life Bloom and, and, um, and, and Calamity and then basic first picture of it. And I'm like, okay, actually, that's a really good shit. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, it is, actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and okay. we have gotten. Uh, like like our, so in our the weeds. like our intrepid <laughs> heroes, we have gotten way off track. <laughs> and, and, still... and, yeah. So, should, should we just segue this into Velvet Remedy and save Canterlot for last, or do you want to go to Canterlot first? L let's save Canterlot for last. But before we get into Velvet, I just want to say before anyone attacks me for being uh, a homophobic straight white man, 
No, I'm not. I'm bisexual. I enjoy sucking cocks and taking it up the ass <laughs> as any other gay man. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 yeah. Like, I, 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 I didn't want to, like, I was going to leave that up to you to, but yeah. Because, yeah, we're, we're all, like, just a, this is, this is, this, this, this podcast is really gay. It's super gay. <laughs> I am gay, gay, gay. I am really, really okay. gay. Oh, okay. Anyway, so. this this will be this will be the thing. Like you know, like if if we went for like you know podcast number five when we do volume five, we need to find like the one like straight FOE writer. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> implying to join us, and they can they can so they can be the uh, minority. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we had fuzzy last time. I don't know what he's. I don't. I don't know. I, let, let's 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 not cast aspersions. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Uh, so, and and if if Velvet was written out of the picture, then it definitely would be Pip Lamity in the story all the way. Yeah. I mean, even, even fuck, if it's just kind of fuck a... Velvet. I hate her. She's a fucking bitch, and I and and she should have died to the slavers in the first act of the story. That's like. Okay. Yeah. My, so mine too. Mine says Jesus Christ to kill. Just kill Velvet. Seriously, yeah. she flew as a death wish. Just let her go. And, <laughs> yeah. and that is the most hilarious thing because we all independently came yeah. to this conclusion. Yeah. Okay, and it was like, yeah, this story would be better. If it was dead. <laughs> um, but yeah, Velvet is kind of awful. This entire volume. Um, like it's. It, it it starts it's st- it starts in this volume anyway with um, there's that conversation about strategy and all the only and Velvet is just completely ignored by everyone. <laughs> it's like yeah. she's yelling to try and like get people's attention and they just ignore her. <laughs> it's like I mean, it also comes back to this, this stuff about ethics where it's it's like this is the character who the story just affords no dignity and just decides is wrong. And just never gives her the time of day, um, and it's. I don't know if this is a thing that was intentional by the author, but um, when they're sneaking around later, after it turns out that um, sniping off the house has attracted more of them, <laughs> um, the, the little pit is like floating velvet on the finger, like a child. <laughs> or like an item in her inventory, <laughs> yeah. And like, like you know, yeah. There's, there's possibly like, you know, she might not be that good at sneaking, but also it's like, you know, after treating her opinion like a child, <laughs> it's like. <laughs> Which I think I think kind of gets into some of the like not like, the yeah. of her. Um, one of the things that I've I've always mentioned about about. Uh, Velvet is honestly she has just so she just really quickly loses any sort of character agency. Mm-hmm. Oh god, yeah. Um, um and and that and it and it's it really is unfortunate for her, like, because I think that it really hurts her as a character. Because if she had any like actual agency, like I think I would be less disinclined to be like, No no, please please let me die so I don't have to deal with this anymore. Yeah, um, and a lot more like, okay, no, she has some points, but instead she's just like the damsel in distress that runs around and does dumb things and then yeah. tries to die and then people keep saving her for reasons. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's trafficking with the enemy. Um, und- Which... Until such point as like we get to Arbu, and then suddenly her morality is just you know all all that all that like compassion, kindness, uh, healing stuff is just like oh no, now now it's time for purge velvet. And well, this. and the problem is is that then then also then that also turns what should have been like her crowning moment of awesome, like which is dealing with the raiders post Canterlot. Um, where she comes across as extremely cold, where yeah. she's like, I don't kill ponies, and I feel like I still haven't. Yeah, and I'm like, it's... you just did, bitch! You killed, like, six with a shotgun yeah, at short range. Like, you, you have uh, been fully converted to the, um, you know, the, the, Murder the fascist ideology Church? of the story, you know? And, 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 and it's in- yeah. your perspective and, has it, been entirely disregarded now, Velvet, you are one of us. <laughs> It's it, it's interesting, Hart, that you bring up uh, oh. this disregard uh, 
for raiders as actual ponies because I'm reminded of this Polish mercenary when asked what it felt like to take human life. He said, I wouldn't know. I've only ever killed communists. That's exactly yeah. how good it feels towards raiders. And, and that's the thing is, is that like, you know, very worrying it, uh, mindset. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but, but, but like, but, but like, what Fuzzy was saying is, is that you have that ideology of like, you, you know, oh boy, these people aren't really people, and it's like, no, they're still people, like they're yeah. fucked up people, and you know, I wouldn't exactly invite them to dinner, but the fact of the matter is, is that like, you, you know, for oh god, and like this kind of gets back in the tone of when I was getting to. I swear every time I have a podcast, but like, and every time I talk about all the questions with other people, it's like, there's, there's, an, there's an aspect in the show of Friendship is Magic that just gets so tossed to the wayside throughout every single, like, Fallout Equestria story that I think I've ever read <laughs> that drives me up a goddamn wall because it's one of those things where their first thought should be, is there a way we can fix this, that we can make friends with this, and if we can't, well, then it's Rainbow Raiders, and, well, in this case, you know, shotguns, but that's never an option in here. The hmm. option is, well, these aren't actually people, so it's okay. Yeah, and I, 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 don't, know if me, I, what? I don't know if I mentioned this in the last <laughs> podcast, but, you know, check out the <laughs> Cosmic Horror. On sale now. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> but, um, I mean, well, I've been, I've been trying to toss that in the speech as well. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we're, now that we've had our own We're all authors here. We're all, we've, you know, we've got all authors. Mine hasn't prisoned yet, but I've been doing it, so. Okay. Um, so, yeah, there's that. And also, um, there's her behavior in Canterlot, which is just kind of dumb. <laughs> like, um... Oh There's, God! The the, uh, the the Ministry of Peace scene. Yeah, the part where she rushes on oh, stage God. into the cloud, and it's like. Just let her die. Yeah. Please let her melt into the floor. As, as Cal Calamity's just like, no, we've got to go in there and save her, and Chip's just like, let her go. You know, she knows what she knows what she's doing. She, <laughs> just she like needs end to do this. There. This is catharsis. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the. I mean, oh God. There's um, there's like. Ideas that the, the story brings up and then doesn't really do a whole lot with of like bleed in, with the memory orbs, um, and I feel like if the story had more of a subplot with that, and um, like maybe Pip was being you know finding herself you know parroting things of you know, she's seen in memory orbs, then maybe this might actually carry a bit more weight. But because. If any of that's been happening, it's been happening off screen in Velvet's head where we can't see it. Velvet just looks like a crazy person. Not <laughs> me. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, like, I just. I, I. I think the, the Ministry of Peace scene is Vel is Velvet's shining moment of stupid. Tell her. Because yeah. throughout the story, she's just been losing herself to this uh, memory orb. And then Little Pip rightly calls her out on her bullshit, to which I think unfairly Velvet throws back at Pip. Oh, well, you've been on Mentats as an addiction, so you don't have any right. It's like... Ah, uh, yes. This, quick way. So, this is a perfect which, example of whataboutism. Yep. Well, actually, also, the, the, the funny thing to me is so that's not only is a perfect example of, of, of whataboutism, it's exactly a response that you would hear from an addict yeah. being confronted about something yeah. they're addicted to. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, she's like, well, you're addicted to this. Bitch, then I know what addiction looks like. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. God, I hate Ralph Velvet so much. I hate her. Oh my god! I mean, I, I, I don't I don't know what else there is to add to this uh, to this scene because it's just it's just dumb. Um, yeah. Like it's it's like I feel, I feel like it was meant to be some kind of climactic payoff, but it just kind of is <laughs> what it is. Yeah. Um, and and then with it, like just like after all this these shenanigans in Arbu and which I thought it just just like. This, she then goes on to be the element of kindness. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, how? How? How was that? Ah! You have to remember, <laughs> this is the same logic where someone who says, 
being honest means knowing when not to be is the element of honesty. Oh yeah, these 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 the uh, the, the elements were each element was kind of produced and defeats the object of run exercise in some way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah, and, and you know you know Kip spends its entire time going you know, corrupted kindness and that sort of thing, and I'm like sitting here going, is that exactly what the new elements are? Because that's kind of how it feels. Yeah. Um uh, except for except for Ditsy do because Ditsy is pure. pure yeah, and yeah, she's, sure. yeah, she's fine. Um, um so <laughs> Horse brought up something about uh, Little Pip having to float Velvet along because yeah. she doesn't know how to sneak. I have a theory about that actually. I think that Velvet is in reality a fat ass. <laughs> And, and and that's why she can't sneak properly, and the, and Pip has to float her around. But through the bias of of Pip's eyes and her infatuation with Velvet, she sees Velvet as not being a fat land whale. <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing at this, but it's kind of into like peak. Um... Photok meme territory by now. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm sorry. I just really hate Velvet, and, yeah. and 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 I will take every opportunity to shit on her. Oh, so the... but, it, but I think we should take this opportunity to bring up a few more of your notes, horse, about how uh, the story could be improved with Velvet's just removal. Just about to get onto that. Um, yes, because it tur it turns out my my summary of like reasons Velvet is shit is just a kind of like uh, yeah here's a bunch of the stupid things that she does in this volume and it's like well now we're at the end of that list so um, so yeah I reasoned out a few ideas as to why you know, how the story would improve say let's say um, they get to <laughs> just do my Ben Shapiro I was just like, let's say let's say uh, <laughs> um, <I don't> <laughs> And so they get to the, the slave camp uh, in like chapter three, I think it is. Yep. Yeah. And uh, Velvet either dies on screen or is dead by the time they get there. Mm -hmm. um, it, the point is that like they go to rescue her and they fail. Um, so this, this changes a number of things. First of all, now um, now Little Pip has a personal motivation for going after Red Eye instead of just kind of vague moral indignation. And I mean, even if you change very little else about the the story other than the necessary mechanical changes to like remove um, from everything else that happened. It's probably not much to be honest. Uh, it it sort of it's like well it, you know now it's personal and that just makes for a more compelling story. Um, the relationship between Little Pip and Calamity that we talked about earlier uh, that has to pick up the slack. So now we might actually, because I, I feel like the, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't want it to seem like I'm contradicting myself by like complaining about uh, subtext not being left to subtext and then complaining about a thing not being on screen. Mm -hmm. but, like I feel like we um, we don't really yeah, we, don't, we don't really understand why Jeff and Calamity hang out with each other, just that they they do, and I feel like if. You know, with Velvet Rose not there, they have a, you know, there's more time for the main character relationship, and you know, yeah, yeah, um, and, and and their relationship can be explored. Yeah, the, the eyebrow noises. Uh, <laughs> um, Zenith. Becomes less redundant without yeah. Velvet there because now the party doesn't have a I suppose this, this also has like this, you know, also, just to the side, um, you know, the, the, the rhythm of the story in combat has a lot of let's just you know, run in, blow all our combat resources, and nearly fucking die, and then Velvet the comes along and patches us up. And it's a it's a it's a rhythm that sort of robs the um, the tension of like attrition out of their adventures. I, I think I mentioned this like a couple of podcasts ago about how like 
you know, if 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 this was as realistic as they want it to be, then you know, why why didn't Pip get like an infection from like one cut back in Stable Sixteen and fucking die? Um. <laughs> well, yeah, that that's a, that I actually had a comment on that because um, that kind of briefly comes up as a point later um, in the the Crusaders chapter where they meet the Wasteland Crusaders. And th- my comment on there was in which in, in which little Pip realizes she's a dumb horse because running into battle while badly wounded is probably a terrible plan. <laughs> yeah, um, and I, I just feel like it's, you know the, the sort of removing the threat of long term consequences from basically every action encounter for most of the story just kind of it's it ties into something I'll get to when we get to Candlelight. But uh, basically, if if they don't have a healer on hand for most of the story and the healer they get later is a lot less immediate like it's just potions and salves and stuff and they heal over time you know suddenly the wasteland feels a lot more dangerous because the mistakes have you know bigger consequences um so that that just like adds much needed tension to a lot of uh, the action scenes um related to the party without Velvet, the party no longer has a member whose point of view they just disregard because they yeah. don't care. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's uh, yeah. Actually, uh, this. Without Velvet there, the idea of Velvet is instead, and that's I think the more important. Part. Because it kind of turns Velvet into this idealized symbol of like a better self. Because it's like she doesn't reach the point where she has to compl- turn into a complete and total hypocrite and talk about purging the mutated flesh out of Arbu. Because she <laughs> she she died without she would have died without compromising her principles of uh, you know I am a medic I am going out to heal people I am healing people I have died in the process but I am healing people. Um, <laughs> And this, I feel like that would just be a, like a more valuable contribution to the story than having a whiny supply of medical supplies and the barter skill who has inconvenient opinions that don't matter to the party. Um, Which I think actually, you know, now that you mentioned that, that would have actually had a lot more impact on the story than like basically what got, which is kind of something similar, but it's only Velvet's thing about it. Yeah. Um. Which, which, in and of itself, isn't necessarily the best thing, because at several points we were dealing with, um, you know, the consequences of Fluttershy, but, like, very early in the chapter, there, you know, there's a scene where basically Fluttershy is basically pegging her and you kill her <laughs> after she's given up the mega spells, and it's like, are you sure this is someone you really want to like? Yeah. You know, yeah. Follow. Um, <laughs> I have some concerns if that's the your your idea of a good time. Concern dot gif. Um, yes. It it, it does kind of shift the I suppose the better version of the other guy kind of having this uh, you know ghost of a better self. Um, it, it, you know it shifts that to yeah. the of it, where it's like. Pip, you know, instead of you know angsting about whatever, Pip can angst about what would Velvet do, and like you know, that that kind of like the, the counter to the more murderous impulses, um, and maybe that could even you know become like a bone of contention between Pip and Calamity for a relationship more brisk the more is that they, um, you know Pip is is. Uh, you know, still got like that kind of soft stable dweller instinct um, of like, well, you know, things like compassion and deep process and uh, what about those? And it's just like, what the fuck are you talking about, kid? You shoot the, you shoot the bandits, it's not hard. And they'd have to work through that. And I, that, that, that's, that's interesting! Yeah. And, and and to add on to that, I, I just thought of this. With Velvet's death, uh, this could actually give Pip an excuse and make Velvet's Pip Buck more useful. Because then, with, her, with Velvet's death weighing on Pip's mind, she could turn to 
uh, Velvet's Pip Buck, and there could be like dozens of logs and entries and just uh, thoughts of Velvet, and, and, yeah. and that could be what uh, Pip bases some of her more humane actions on, of thinking, yeah. okay, well, th this is a list of all the good things Velvet has done that she's recorded. And then Pip could think of herself, well, what would Velvet do in this situation? And and as you sort of alluded to, Velvet would become to Pip what Fluttershy becomes to Velvet. Which, speaking of, I fucking hate Velvet, and I fucking hate Fluttershy. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, okay, that, well, I love Fluttershy, but... That, that part where we uh, just exchange one problem for another. <laughs> yeah, this, th this story is mainly the reason why I fucking hate Fluttershy so much. <laughs> Not because of any of her characters and the characterization in the show, but because of that. Yes, movie. yes, yeah. because honestly, that's th that's kind of what season one Fluttershy was set out to be, is like... No, you're not wrong. Yeah. No, I'm not. Uh, yeah. And and uh, even when they go to the Ministry of Peace and they go to that boardroom where Fluttershy uh, wrote Care, which is communally assured reciprocal Poor peace. No, uh, make it. reciprocal, no, reciprocal. Is it existence. Existence. That's existence. it. God, that is that that is such a fucking retarded mentality to have. Well, it's 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 uh, it, it, it's mutually assured destruction just with uh, a horse. Happy face it's stuck on. Yeah, it's it's that's it's it's very flawed thinking. I mean, like. Well, yeah, it's almost I... like mutually assured destruction was kind of mad. <laughs> okay, see, I'm of the opinion that an armed society is a polite society, but that doesn't mean. Okay, okay, all right. So. It doesn't mean everybody should have bail fire. Bail taking bail taking this train of thought to its logical extreme. I believe that everyone, and I mean everyone, should own recreational nukes. In an ideal world, no one would fuck with each other. No one would fuck with each other in, in, in the real world, but all it takes is one insane motherfucker to think, you know what? Fuck all of you. We're all going to die. I hate everyone, and I'm fucking crazy. And, and, and that's exactly what the zebras did. Because they were fucking crazy and psychotic enough to think, you know what? Fuck this shit, I'm out! <laughs> and, the, and they just write the death letter for the entire world. Whereas Fluttershy was thinking of it, oh, if, if both sides have mega spells to heal each other, then there'll be no need to fight. Then they have to stop fighting. But Fluttershy's a fucking retard, and that's why I hate her. Them. Because you don't give oh, weapons so to a, a society that hates your guts on an, an on an instinctual oh, level. See, see that that um that that. Well, especially. Can you find oh, good. Uh, I, I, I was just gonna say it kind of uh, it, it it sort of um it reminds me of the assumptions the story makes about how there are people who cannot be reasoned with and yeah. must be destroyed. Definitely, and it's it's like. Uh, it, it, Flo Fluttershy is like another casualty of this. It's like the story is saying, look what happens if you try to be peaceful. You just die. And it's like, story, you really think about this. <laughs> There's the comparison of this destroyed destruction, which is basically the reason, you know, the, the theory is, is the reason why we've, you know, thankfully not nuked ourselves <laughs> in oblivion. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that, like, one of the things I think we're going to do, too, is, is with her doing this, um, God, yeah, it, uh, there's, you know, obviously she's been kind of handed the idiot ball, but yeah, you're right, it, at the same time, it's also that, well, see, there's people that can't be reasoned with, but then, like, in the same breath, when you get, there's the, there's things you, they can't be reasoned with, she also gets, like, more information about, like, the zebra's point of view, mm -hmm. and, like, all the other stuff that, like, the Ministry of Awesome was doing, and how, like, Rarity was thinking about, like, soul-jarring armor, yeah, it's... And, and that sort of thing, and, like, with finding the prophecy in, in, in Zebra Town, um, like, one of the things that Pip even thinks to herself is just, like, no wonder Fluttershy's plan failed horribly. It had nothing to do with the fact that, um, 
the raiders because the raiders the story as far as the raiders as far as the story is concerned the raiders are non-persons the zebras the, um, the the there is that whole thing about the you know the when when luna gets involved the the war escalates for mm -hmm. wibbly cultural reasons into you know an existential struggle and it's like it, i can see the story writing itself into a point where from the zebra's perspective destroying the world is a preferable option to letting their nightmare move in. You know, it, it, it's yeah. Yeah. So uh, well, preferable to letting Nightmare Moon win, or or dealing with the fact that like again, it's that 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 issue of tech progression, like. <laughs> eventually it gets to the point where realistically if your enemy has advanced to the point where you cannot keep up with them from a tactical perspective well do you have an option do you have a choice yeah. and and and, I mean, and it's from that same point of view that i feel steel hooves prejudice towards zebras is entirely justified every zebra though uh, the vast majority of zebras. Because you have to admit, the the reasonable zebras that exist in Equestria are the minority. Uh, I, I, I suppose we're relying on the accounts of Midnight Shower here for that. Um, I, yeah, I, this is, I, I feel like I'd, I'd need to go back and the read stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. I, feel, I feel like we're, we're kind of sliding back into a previous topic here, so when we've still got Catalot to get through. Right, um, yeah, this, that's still weighing heavily on my mind. We still haven't gotten Catalot yeah, yet. So. I, I, I did just kind of want to get into Glyphmark one last time, because I actually forgot about the notes I had written down no. for the prophecy that was found in oh, yeah. the yeah, yeah, jail cell. So. The... You're welcome. So, <laughs> let me just pull that up again real quick. Uh, it was actually really good. By the light of our stars, we illuminate your end and shine on the graves of all zebra kind. A hundred thousand nightmares will descend upon you. The armies of our dark child will fill the skies, and foes from impenetrable cities will fall upon all your land. Shielded by armor crafted from their very souls, rejoice with us, for every single one of you shall die. So, at, Happy. as with most prophecies, they're vague and open to interpretation. Uh, as I've already established, everything I say is right, so here's my interpretation <laughs> of this prophecy. So, a uh, hundred thousand nightmares will descend upon you. This is obviously referring to the missiles and the mega spells and the balefire bombs dropping all over Equestria. Now, the armies of our Dark Child, that's capitalized, Dark Child, will fill the skies. I'm, in, I'm honestly not sure what Dark Child refers to here. Uh, and foes from impenetrable cities will fall upon all your lands. Impenetrable cities. Now, I don't know about you two, but when I think of impenetrable cities, the first thing that comes to mind are the stables. Because they are cities and they are impenetrable. But foes from impenetrable cities will fall upon all your lands. That's, that's very confusing to me, but it's the next line that I've really focused in on. Shielded by armor crafted from their very souls. Okay, so, this line. This line is not referring to the Steel Rangers, because Applejack adamantly refused Rarity's research on soul jars. So, so it can't be the Steel Rangers and their armor. But, if we take into account that impenetrable cities refers to the stables, shielded by armor crafted from their very souls, this is what makes me believe that Apple Moon got involved in soul jar magic 
and she got it from Zakora, and it's been used throughout every project she, she worked on, and that explains why uh, the SPP towers are are uh, very resilient, and they haven't suffered any damage over 200 years. And that would explain why uh, Little Pip's Pip Buck could take a light machine round, I'm sorry, an anti-machine round, and, and like, s survive a shot from that. And also how she keeps finding uh, computers that are still running 200 years later, which is backed up by the fact that uh, during the phone call between Apple Bloom and Sweetie Bell, where it's like two sides of a conversation, Apple Bloom calls Sweetie Bell to talk about uh, Applejack's assassination in the coma, and Sweetie Bell overhears Fluttershy crying to Rarity about being called a traitor. It's like all, all these things happening in one phone call. And Apple Bloom makes an offhand remark of like, oh, I bet I could make better computers than the ones that are out on the market right now. So, um, yeah, those are my thoughts on oh, I'm sorry, Zebra Town. I know. It could also be a reference. <laughs> it could, I was just thinking it could also be a reference to, to Raptors and Thunderheads. Um, this is also true. Uh, the armies of our Dark Child, where the Pegasi embrace the Shadow Bolts from the very first <laughs> episode of the series, where they're like Nightmare Moon's cronies, but not real. Mm. Mm -hmm. And and Rainbow Dash stated that she specifically did that because it freaked them out. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, that's that's all I had to say. I know that's a lot to take in, uh, and I know it's a hard pill to swallow, but... Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I guess I just, I just hadn't thought about the prophecy too much in terms of, like, what it literally refers to. Um, I mean, it's it's, it's one, of the, one, of the, one of the details that didn't jump out at me as much, so I don't have much to say about it, really. Um, mm -hmm. You know, actually thinking about it now that I'm like reprocessing things, actually, no, that makes a lot more sense of thinking that the reference, because it's a prophecy and that was kind of an impetus for things. And considering that there's been some suggestions that, that a lot of the zebras had similar things happening back at home, it would be interesting to me to see whether or not, like, if one of the things that was repeatedly mentioned that is still the reason why um the equestrians were still winning the war was because air superiority is a thing yep and yeah that being a potential future for them of you know if if, if the equestrians have been able to like up their uh, ramp up their raptor and like thunderhead production i mean we see later in the start in the fifth fifth volume like just how much damage a single raptor can do by itself You know, and you know the indication is is there somewhere around like fifty to sixty of the remaining basically yeah. that before the war ended. After the war ended, and there's four of these thunderheads, which are like that on steroids. And half the time that I always think of thunderheads, I think of like basically like the like a gold Hatak mothership floating on clouds, yeah. which is a horrifying image. Um, <laughs> but like you know that sort of thing, like that's there's four that survives that and blows up a bunch of them, but like the fact of the matter is that those things are really cool. Yes. Because uh, yeah, one we'll, blows up we'll, another we'll one. We'll get into the stupid stuff next next one. Yeah, but basically like that's it's that's a horrifying thought. <laughs> um of like seeing those things and you know how massive these things are meant to be. Um I don't know, that just it makes a lot more sense and that, you know, that would be the, the zebra fear of equestrian air superiority. So. Absolutely. Anyways, I, I'm sorry to distract us further. Um, I just I just had to talk about that. Uh, it, it was burning in my mind. Yeah, we're here to talk about the story. So, anyways, um, so you said you had uh, some, like, very... Uh, direct notes about Kenrolot? Oh yeah, they're 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 actually quite succinct for such a long chapter. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the first is is actually something I've mentioned in previous podcasts, which is um, it's 
no, it's, it's, it's sort of adjacent to the writing style stuff, which is the idea of writing scenes with uh, gameplay tension instead of narrative tension. Um, the whole rhythm of going room to room, clearing the and then moving on to the next one. There's a lot of that. Um, stuff like Jumper Rattles, Kissed by Luna Perk. It's, yeah. It's just, it's stuff that just takes you out of it. Yeah. Um, it, well, there's, there's the stuff that takes you out of it like that. And then there's just the, the, the stuff that feels like that. We, we covered this already. I won't, I won't dwell on it. Um, just the, the, the whole transcribing the rhythm of the game. Or, or trying to emulate the rhythm of the game, and it just it feels bad. <laughs> um, but I suppose that leads into um, the the main point I have about Candlelock, which is um, that it um, there's a lot of like shock content in Candlelock, but there's not a lot of tension. And I feel like what do you mean by shock content? Uh, well, it, it, the the, 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 the people die in extremely horrible ways in Cantalot, and it's obviously it's you know that's the idea. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, there's the you know I was just like reading stuff about like you know the I, th I think the, the thing that really made my skin crawl was the the, the like the air pressure going up and just oh, yeah you know I just <laughs> it's it's all it's all you know pretty grisly stuff and like that makes sense you know they they're they're going to Cantalot, they're basically going to hell. Um, but the, my problem with this is that this is sort of a missed opportunity to have this section be basically a horror section, just because the the way the um, the rhythm of their journey through Cantalot goes, it lacks sort of the tense downtime. We instead have um a tedious slog from one plot and backstory artifact to the next with a cavalcade of pain in between <laughs> um and this 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 chapter really would have done better if you would have cut it at every memory orb oh yeah yeah and, and one not not only just so it wasn't a what is it 50,000 50, and chapter. thankfully that's exactly what crazed <sighs> rambling does yeah. he, he he sorts the reading by memory orb yeah like that that does that does make it like easier to like get through in chunks um but but even then i feel like a lot of, a lot of stuff can just be cut uh well it, it's it's like it, stuff could be like cut around and rearranged like we don't need scene after scene after scene of my organs are failing my eyes are bleeding by you know the um, static is killing me it's the story like fixates on the suffering of the party so long and so repeatedly that it just kind of robs it of any narrative power that it might have like i feel like but horse don't you know that suffering is character <laughs> development <laughs> um oh god <laughs> Yeah, the, um, I, I just feel like you know, we, we would have had like a much more engaging, you know, dungeon crawl through Candlelot if we'd um, if we'd instead had like you know brief bursts of just this you know intense danger and peril interspersed between you know longer sequences of um, like threat because the, the, there are there are quiet moments like there's the, the bit in the school where they're just like before everything shows up and. Um, there's like the the bit with the um, the, 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 the the using the shield spell like a duck and cover thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is it's kind of cute. Um, you know, there's a nice little bit of humor that actually lands. Uh, but um, the, those those like or, or like the in the Ministry of Arcane Sciences, which is almost like a puzzle box of a, of a sequence. Um, it's you know, the, the, there isn't like that much threat. But, like, I, I didn't feel threat in those sequences. It's just kind of, oh well, the, you know, the when I press T, it tells me how long I want to wait, not like how many enemies there are nearby, or not <laughs> that there are enemies nearby. Um, and yeah, I was, thinking, oh, I was thinking that, that you you'd mentioned earlier that like that there's a lost opportunity in like the horror scene aspect of this, and. You know, because actually, like, the thing that, that really creeped me out about this entire thing was them mentioning, or uh, was her mentioning going through the, uh, the Ministry of Peace, and there's nothing. Yeah, I, I, I guess that there's, like, yeah, I mean, I, I, did, I was kind of, you know, waiting for the, it's like, like, 
when's, when's stuff going to burst out of the walls? Because they've just gone through the school and it was all ghoul children and stuff like that. Um, yeah. It's like mutated angel bunny. Yeah. I mean... Something, I don't know. The, yeah. I, I mean... The, it's, it's, it's not, like, completely absent of threat, but it just felt like it could have been better constructed to maximize the, um, sort of the build and release cycle of, like, threat and, you know, then the scare. It's like, the, we, don't, we don't get, like, you know, creaky noises that put everyone on edge and just kind of remind them to stop arguing in circles about nothing about lunch, goddammit! Uh, <laughs> It's like they are, you know, you, 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 the fact that they can just sit there and like be horny at each other and have fights about nothing, and it doesn't really like they don't lose anything by that. <laughs> just kind of makes the the downtime sequences feel like, oh well, we might as well be in town. Um, right. Which you know, yeah, like I said, that, that's why like the horror aspect would have been a lot more interesting to see that like. Um, the the alicorn that shows up, and I know the alicorn um, that's in like that's near where Calamity's captured in the mist. Oh, the, the one the one that's it. chained up and told you it's all. Yeah, the one that's referencing it's basically referencing God and Dog from um, Dead Money, but oh. like that thing escaping and then following them. Ooh, like, yeah, that would have been. Oh, from 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 Resident Evil Three would have just been fantastic. That would have been, yeah. Because, especially since it's been, like, exposed to so much radiation and necromantic energy, this thing just is basically like, hi, coming through the wall, I, there's not anything you can do about it, <laughs> except um, run. <laughs> or, yeah. or, like, uh, Mr. X from Resident Evil 2. Yeah. Oh, God, Mr. X, no! <laughs> <laughs> I still have nightmares oh, about the, that. Oh the, 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 oh, the one for me was uh, the one in Resident Evil 4, the dude with the bag on his head and the chainsaw. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, the, the, Oh, God, yeah. what? As, as long as you shot him with a shotgun enough, he, he was less of an issue. But oh wait, there was a uh, there was the, there was another one later on. The like the regenerating thing. Ah, yeah, the regenerators. Oh, no. fuck the regenerators. We 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 that breathing sound. That breathing sound is going to haunt my nightmares <laughs> <laughs> for life. Uh, but um, yeah, I yeah, cause, cause I, I feel like that that, uh, that reference could have been used uh, a lot better as well. Um, because uh, there's this. Other, I mentioned about like bleed with the memory orbs, because um, there's there's also elements of like they could have really run with something really, you know skin crawling and creepy with the the idea of like the telepathy and the sort of the the sort of the dissolving of individuality in the alicorns and how that kind of breaks down in Cantalot, but it's still not completely gone, and it's there's a lot of like really interesting, like, creepy things you could do with that. I mean, they just don't. <laughs> it's the, um, they're, it, yeah. At best, it, it, it's used for a trans joke when one alicorn says, I oh, remembered yeah. I used to be a stallion. Yeah. Yeah, that, that throwaway line actually kind of is one of those things where it's like, hey, you've got, like, LGBT representation. Oh, never mind. You're, you're sure. <laughs> it's, like it's like, oh, yeah, it's 2011. I forgot. Uh, also in this in the scene with that, that alicorn, the, um... This is this is also where the room is filling with hydrogen and we, we just have, like, a... Oh, yeah! Helium <laughs> joke. Yep. And... Uh, I'm... I have mixed feelings about the, the, the presence of the levity in this scene, where it's just like, yeah, I mean, like, moments of levity should probably be thrown into Camelot somewhere, but... Uh, <laughs> it's a... It, it, it's, it's like a casualty of the priorities of the chapter, which is to cover all the bases lore-wise, um, and uh, have, like, a compelling tension release cycle secondary. Um, yeah. Like, because because in between, I mean, I'm all for the alicorn fart jokes, but yeah, that, that just. <laughs> um, I mean, we have. Um, so what did hydrogen actually do the uh, the squeaky voice thing? I don't know. Well, um, I mean, uh, helium would. But yeah. I mean, uh, hydrogen is far lighter than helium, so yeah, by logic, it, it would do that. Well, it's the uh, it's the density is the thing. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It, we'd have to like ask. Uh, 
chemist or something. Um, yeah. But uh, 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 real quick, uh, a quick shout out to Craze Rambling for actually doing a pitch shift for the audiobook yeah. to uh, to replicate that effect. Yeah. So, uh, um, kudos to him. Also, also, oh, what wow. the fuck? They're filling their airships with hydrogen. <laughs> Well, yeah, what else are you going to fill your dirigibles with? Um, helium. Yeah. Yeah, but hydrogen is lighter than helium. Yes, it, it is, it but... It, it also uh, explodes. It, helium is less explodey. <laughs> oh. See see the uh, the Hindenburg. Oh, uh, that, that, that was just a one-time thing. <laughs> hydrogen only explodes once. We got that out of the way. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was also the thing that took down the USS Akron and another USS something that was one of the uh, Navy's airships that we had for a while and then decided they were a terrible idea. <laughs> uh, so that was kind of my main point about Cantalot is just like that there's like potential here and it was it sort of went begging in favor of more loot hunts um and also just the length of it just my brain just turned to yeah. fuzz halfway through and it's just like i can't keep track of everything here it's just, yeah it's by the it's time too much. I, I feel got, sick <laughs> by the time i got to chapter 37 like i was so fed up with volume four because like it had taken so long to get to this major plot point that i kind of stopped caring uh, and like, and, and, and okay, yeah. here's the thing about volume four, everything up until this point has been about red eye and it was a great story. And then volume four shifts more towards the goddess and it just kind of lost its way. And it made me lose interest because it didn't make the goddess interesting. There wasn't a whole lot of diving into the mythology and uh, just the creation of the goddess and the story with her. Um, which KCAT could have done that. We could have gotten some more narrative building with the goddess, but that would have been like even more distracting I mean, for the I story. Mean, so. The backstory is in there. I just feel like it would have been more prominent if it was uh, less cluttered with crap. Yes. Like how in the, uh, in the NAS, we, um, we get the, uh, the development diaries of the stealth suit. Mm -hmm. Is this really necessary? Yeah. Do yeah. we have to stop and... Uh, yeah. Yeah, the stealth, the stealth suit, like, especially since, like... I don't know, the stealth suit, actually, that entire scene drove me nuts, because, like, it was one of those things where I was sitting there thinking, like, if you're going to get, give her, basically, like, I understand, like, you know, in the, in the old world blues, you get the stealth suit, and you have to pick up the pieces and put it together, but, like, it, that would be one thing if that was what she was getting, but she just ended up getting, like, the gem for it, and the, the little spell thing for the, the pip mark, uh. or the stealth buff mark, too, and I'm like, why did you need to give me, like, five pages of dev diaries yeah. on this? I don't care. Oh, and, and also, gay representation! Yay! <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah. What was the gay okay, so, in the journal of the development of the stealth suit, uh, the journal alludes to two stallions having an affair. Oh, okay. I, 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 I remember Wait. there being, like, a thing about, like... Uh, there's like uh, workplace fraternizing, and maybe they shouldn't do that. Yeah. I didn't realize they were both stunned. Yes, yeah, yeah, they were stunned. Yeah. The, 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 the story largely um, it takes the, um, the, uh, the, the uh, obsidian approach to sexuality, which is just let people be gay and let's just move on. And yes. That, that, I, I, just, Me too. We got too much. Else, we, we got too much else to talk about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't. Surely there must be something else we have to talk about with Candlelight other than like, oh my god, it's so long. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 a lot. Okay. Let's talk about uh, the Ministry of Awesome and the linchpin that plays for the rest of the story with the introduction of the on uh, how okay okay this, this 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 is the part where like my um you know the monty python sketch where there's like the big 
fat guy and there's just he's just like just have how I fat thin slice that was me with this story by the time I got to the Ministry of Oz <laughs> <laughs> so like my my, my 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 recollection of this part of the story is incredibly hazy <laughs> Okay, so it, it, the the Ministry of Awesome Warehouse is where we get a little bit more insight into the uh, the single Pegasus project, uh, where, where they talk about Rainbow Dash's plan. With okay, it's supposed to be controlled by one pony. Uh, I, I made some changes to the computer mainframe. I don't want any of that nonsense of uploading your brain into a computer and thinking it's a pony, uh, which was addressed in the game Soma, which is great by the way. You play Soma. Um, I think I own that actually. But uh, <laughs> basically, there, there's no such thing as uploading one's brain. Uh, it's just making a copy and uploading that data into a hard drive. But anyways, um, Little Pip makes the comment that the the suspended animation pod was never used, and this deeply confuses me because. Is the suspended animation pod inside the Ministry of Awesome hub in Canterlot, or is this the suspended animation pod in the SPP tower in Navarro, where Little Pip eventually finds Celestia? That's my question. Where is it? Like, is this pod actually located inside the Ministry of Awesome? I don't think so. Yeah. I think the, the implication was that it is, it is installed in Navarro. Okay. So, okay, so that confuses me, because if that's the case, I thought Celestia went inside the uh, animation pod while simultaneously uh, linking herself into the potato mainframe and transferring the soul jar into the Yeah. Okay, okay, so, well... <laughs> this is fucking okay. okay. I, I, I yeah, guess much, we'll just much, much like trekking through Canterlot to retrieve the black book. This is a part of the uh, a part of the plot that to actually reach it, you have to put yourself through such an ordeal that by the time you get there, you've no idea what's happening. Yeah, it's. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, KK. You've written Cantalot in such a way that by the time we get to the end of it, we feel the same way the characters do. Yeah, really. <laughs> we would like we'd like three days of rest, and our bodies feel like we've been traumatized yeah. and beaten up. <laughs> and 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 the and my the tablet pen is fused to my hand. <laughs> <laughs> my book is fused to my hand. I don't like this. <laughs> and, and and the worst part about Volume Five is every chapter is upwards of fifteen thousand words. In fact, three three of the chapters average at thirty thousand words each. Okay, except now I'm feeling bad because most of my chapters average between ten and fifteen. But <laughs> I mean, that's good. Toad Plunging is also a thing. Like the broken star of the chapters, but there's only going to be that's fair, but I don't know, like, but not all the ways in the world, that was a little bit more. Yeah, like, for 30,000-word chapters, I'm just... It's, I, I think by the time KCAT reached 5, he was just in a rush to get everything done and wrapped up, so that's why the chapters are so fucking long. <laughs> I would have thought that it wasn't the shrink. No. I thought it was... Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, we covered the Ministry of Arcade Science, we covered the Ministry of Awesome. Uh, Rarity employs snips and snails to cut up her soul into pieces. Why, why are snips and snails included? Because they're in season one. Yeah. <laughs> There's a reminder that this is written in season one and we've only got so much lore to work with. Um, yeah. I, d I, d I do actually... Uh, it did occur to me reading the... Um, the conversation between snips and snails is yeah this is actually pretty um it's it's th that sounds like them you know it does <laughs> the, yeah the character the character that it's th that rare thing in season one fan fan fiction where the dynamic between two characters is well their only character I, that wasn't that wasn't the sentence i was saying okay um, <laughs> the, the dynamic between two characters is 
uh, you know, transferred into the story <laughs> without just going through the show verbatim. Oh god, there I mean, are so yeah. many parts in this story where the show is fully verbatim. I mean, yeah. I mean it's they, kind of annoying. I mean, there is like a, a reference a little on the... It's like, it's like, wow, you really remember this one. But but it's only one line. The rest of it is. Just, uh, it's, it's, it's yeah. It's. Got here is the Grows and cramps and buildings down here. Yeah. Dead. Oh. Yeah. Um. I I I did really enjoy the Pinkie Pie memory level where the kid is like in on the conversation between Pink and Mina and her. Soul reflection. I personally enjoyed that. Scene. I that was good, and and, and, and it's 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 a really good setup for the uh, climax of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's really all I, all I have to say about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, like I remember like passing note on that scene, and it was just but not like anything massively conclusive. It's just kind of. Oh, this is a thing. Yeah. I'm not sure how to feel about it. It's a little weird. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Logic. Don't question it. It's, you know, that, that, um... It's characterizations of Pinkie Pie that just kind of rest on her, like, just breaking reality and stuff. And it's like, I'm not <laughs> always a... I, I'm, I'm not a massive fan of lol random Pinkie. I, I feel like there there is, like, more to her character that, 